In this video, I'm going to be taking seashells from the beach, adding some heat, and then turning them into dry ice with a little bit of thermodynamics. A few months ago, I made a video about how to produce dry ice from scratch, but the methods for both producing the CO2 and cooling it to dry ice temperatures were a real hassle, so I wanted to improve both of those. Let's start with the CO2 production. Previously, I used the well-known reaction of baking soda with an acid to produce CO2, but when I did the math, I found that the reagents were costing me quite a bit per pound of CO2 and wanted to find a cheaper way to get it. So I took a trip to the beach and collected seashells until I had a box full of them. Seashells are mostly made up of limestone or calcium carbonate. When calcium carbonate is heated to around 900 C, it decomposes into calcium oxide and CO2. At least that's the theory. Let's see if it actually works. I'm going to burn some chunks of seashells with map gas, and if they react with water after cooling off, that means I have calcium oxide, which also means I successfully liberated CO2. One hint that we've got a decent concentration of calcium oxide is that the glow of the hot shells will become very intense. It's hard to tell from the video, but the light coming off these things is actually really bright. That's limelight, which was used for bright indoor lighting before electric lights were common. I let the shells cool off to room temperature, and then applied a few drops of water to one of them. After a few seconds, the water starts to bubble and the shell swells and flakes apart. This process is called slaking, where the calcium oxide reacts with water to form calcium hydroxide. Let's try it again with a bigger batch. As you can see, the reaction can be pretty violent. With the right ratio of water, the temperature can reach as high as 300 C. This reaction throws blazing hot bits of lime all over the place, so safety glasses are a must. That's pretty cool, but I'm not interested in the calcium oxide. I want the CO2. If I can get these seashells this hot inside of a sealed container, then I can capture the CO2 and store it for later to make dry ice. This would make the CO2 nearly free except for the cost of the energy, but that's going to be a lot less than the cost of reagents for other reactions, even with a really low efficiency. As fancy as this sounds, the process has been known to humans since antiquity. In the Middle Ages, being a so-called lime burner was a full-time job where a guy would just shovel a bunch of limestone onto a fire that was fed with forced air to keep it hot enough to drive the decomposition reaction. The difference was that they weren't interested in the CO2, but the calcium oxide that was left behind. Calcium oxide, also known as quicklime, violently reacts with water to form calcium hydroxide or slaked lime. The slaked lime would be mixed with sand to make mortar to hold stones together, which is kind of important if you're trying to build a castle. Anyway, I didn't want to use fire to drive the reaction, so at first I considered concentrated solar power, but it quickly became apparent that it would be way too much of a hassle to go this route. I decided instead that this would be a perfect excuse to build an induction heater, so I made the ZVS oscillator circuit to run off 48 volts with this copper coil as the induction coil. This 1 inch pipe will be the furnace that will get heated up with the seashells inside of it. Before heating, this cap with a flare fitting adapter will be screwed onto the top to seal the pipe. The flare will attach to a hose for gas collection. Doing a quick test run looks like it has no problem getting the pipe red hot. According to this incandescence chart, that color should be around 900 to 1000 C, which should be hot enough for the limestone decomposition to take place. The pipe will be heated inside of a fire brick enclosure, but the induction coil will be on the outside where it's close to room temperature. The fire brick is invisible to the magnetic fields of the coil. I start by marking out a square fire brick, then start drilling small holes along the marking. Then I knock out the centerpiece with a hammer and use this grinder bit to smooth it out. In retrospect, this was a really bad idea because the brick completely smoothed out the teeth on the grinder. For the last step, I used the chisel to carve the outside. It was made this shape so that the induction coil could be wound around it. Then I used furnace cement to glue the fire bricks together so the induction coil and the fire brick oven basically form one piece. Here's a quick test run of the induction heater with only the cap portion of the pipe sitting inside the brick. It glows a really bright orange, although for some reason my camera shows it slightly pink. The only problem was that the cap alone pulls close to 10 amps from my power supply, which has a limit of 12 amps, and when I put the entire pipe assembly in, it blew up the MOSFETs on the ZVS oscillator circuit. I actually blew up a whole lot of MOSFETs trying to make this circuit work, so let's look at the electrical engineering side of things for a minute to see what's going on. Without getting super deep into theory, a ZVS driver basically self-oscillates at the resonant frequency of the circuit's capacitor and inductor. In this case, the inductor is the induction coil heating our pipe. The MOSFETs are switching at the zero crossing voltage across the inductor, which is why it's called a zero voltage switching or ZVS circuit. 
This is known as soft switching, which allows the inductor and capacitor to have enormous amounts of peak currents across them while the MOSFETs see a relatively small load and usually aren't very stressed. However, if you keep the same inductor but increase the capacitor size in the circuit, you'll start to pull more current even without a load. In my case, this current was large enough that when a load was added to the induction coil, the load current plus the idle current was enough to blow up one of the FETs. So I reduced my capacitance to cut down on the idle current, but the problem is that increases the resonant frequency and the MOSFET gates have a hard time keeping up with this resistor divider supplying them voltage, which leads to less efficient operation because the FETs resistance is higher at lower gate voltages. Plus, the whole resistor divider thing is really inefficient when I have to bump 48 volts down to 12 volts. So I got rid of the resistors and used a pair of transistors in a push-pull configuration to drive the gates, which have a separate 12 volt supply so I don't have to worry about down converting the 48 volts. The circuit works much better with these, the only problem is that this nasty switching noise that shows up when the voltage is raised above about 24 volts or so. The peaks look like they go above the 20 volt maximum for the MOSFET gate, so this could potentially ruin the circuit. To soak up the high frequency noise, I stuck these snubbers on both rails of the oscillator. This number consists of a 10 ohm resistor with a 2.2 nanofarad capacitor. This will damp out the super fast ringing when the FETs switch on without interfering with the oscillation of the main capacitor and inductor. Now the whole thing seems to be running pretty happy. Oh, hang on, somebody's at the door. Hey look, it's Xi Jinping, and he brought friends. What are you guys doing here? My birthday party isn't until tomorrow. Uh, guys? Well, this is a doozy. All the worst people on earth just seem to be hanging out in my living room watching everything I do. If only I could get a little privacy. Lucky for me, I've got Surfshark. Surfshark is a virtual private network, or VPN, that passes all my internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel to one of their servers so that sketchy governments, nosy companies, and random hackers can't monitor it. I find this to be especially useful when I travel for work and want to check my bank account from potentially sketchy public Wi-Fi sources in hotels or convention centers. Okay, so maybe you don't care about privacy or security, you just want to watch TV and movies. Surfshark comes in handy there too, because most streaming services block a lot of their content based on your location. Ever wonder what Netflix in Greenland is like? Wonder no more with Surfshark. With over 3200 servers in 100 different countries, you can make yourself appear to be practically anywhere and get around those annoying geofencing policies. But it gets better. Did you know that services like hotels and airlines will often charge you a different price based on where you're trying to book from? You could potentially save a boatload of money on a future trip by using Surfshark to change your IP address to a different country before you book and get the best price possible. So if you want to browse the internet securely, get around geofences and save money, then click the link in the description to get Surfshark VPN and enter promo code HYPERSPACEPIRATE for a holiday special offer of 5 extra months for free with the Surfshark 1 package. Okay, back to the matter at hand. Let's crush up some shells to feed them into the furnace. I started off by crushing the big ones on a piece of wax paper, but it quickly became apparent that I need to do this inside of a bag. They're still pretty coarse, but these pieces should be small enough to work, so I feed them into the pipe and start baking. I initially did this with the pipe cap connected directly to my gas collection ball, but found that I wasn't collecting anything, and to confirm this wasn't just from leaks, I pulled out the crushed shells and found they weren't reacting with water, meaning the furnace wasn't getting hot enough to separate the CO2. This seemed kind of odd, because I read online that the reaction should happen at around 900 C, but after doing a little more research, I found this graph that showed the reaction temperature versus pressure, and you can clearly see that at one atmosphere it's 900 C. But that doesn't mean when it's 900 C, CO2 suddenly comes rushing out. The CO2 is at one atmosphere, so it just kind of sits inside the pipe and doesn't go anywhere. The CO2 and calcium oxide just sit in the pipe in chemical equilibrium with the limestone separating and recombining back and forth, and nothing interesting really happens. To actually make something happen, we need to pull down the pressure inside the furnace. So for example, if we're at 900 C, but we pull down to 0.01 atmospheres, we'll have a pressure difference that forces out the CO2 as it separates since our temperature is above the equilibrium temperature for 0.01 atmospheres. So here's the setup with the vacuum pump attached to it. This is an oilless vacuum pump with an outlet port that I can connect to so that I can capture its output and don't have to worry about oil mist contaminating the CO2. And here's the beach ball after two hours of baking. It's about two thirds full, so I'd estimate about 15 liters of CO2 has been produced. We can verify that this is CO2 by squeezing a little bit of it into a beaker and then dropping this burning paper inside. The paper is instantly extinguished and doesn't even smolder since there's no oxygen. The other way to verify that CO2 has been released is by slaking the leftover lime. It goes absolutely crazy and bubbles all over the place when water is added. 
Even around a minute after the reaction peaked, my thermocouple still read over 100 C. The slicked lime turns into a powder that makes a really fine slurry in water, and I managed to make this neat little brick out of it after drying for a few days. I'm going to store my CO2 gas in a larger container by transferring it from my small beach ball to my big beach ball. I open a valve between them and literally just squeeze the ball until all the gas is moved over. Then I shut the valve and disconnect the smaller ball. It's pretty low tech, but it's cheap and it works. The limestone decomposition process takes way too long at the temperature my ZVS driver is able to provide, so I'm just going to make the rest of my CO2 the easy way and react it with vinegar. At least this way I'm saving part of the reagent cost by eliminating the need to get baking soda. Like before, the CO2 is collected in my small beach ball. Now just out of curiosity, when the reaction was complete, I filtered off the solution, which should be only calcium acetate and water, since I had an excess of she shells. I boiled the water off the calcium acetate until I was left with this funny sludge that was kind of like cottage cheese or mashed potatoes. Supposedly when calcium acetate is heated, it should release acetone, so I set up a really crappy distillation apparatus and turned my heater up to full to see if I could produce some. A little bit of blue liquid started to come over, and I think this is from leftover vinegar distilling out and then reacting with the oxidized copper tubing to make copper acetate, which has the blue color. The resulting liquid did burn, so I guess I got some acetone, but the distillation took multiple hours, so I don't think it's really worth doing. The calcium acetate can still be useful as a solid fuel if you soak some alcohol into it. When the mixture is ignited, it initially burns the alcohol, but the heat of the fire causes the calcium acetate to release its acetone, which then burns and keeps the fire going for quite a while. This could be useful for some sort of camping or survival situation, since it seems to burn a lot better than most woods. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. Over a few days, I continued dissolving seashells in vinegar and collecting the CO2 until I had enough of it to pretty much completely fill my big beach ball. In my last dry ice video, I forced the CO2 to liquefy by compressing it in an ice bath which required at least 35 bar of pressure or around 500 psi. That was a major hassle and it was really inefficient, so instead I'm just going to be borrowing the pre-cooling stage of my Joule Thompson cryo cooler. This is just a propane vapor compression system, but connected to a plate heat exchanger on the evaporator which I can pump CO2 gas in under pressure and chill down to about minus 30 or minus 40 C, which would only require between 10 and 14 bar or 130 to 190 PSI. On the lower connection of the heat exchanger, I attach this adapter that's just a valve with a flare connection and a capillary tube to limit flow and drop pressure, which is what the CO2 will discharge through. On the top connection of the heat exchanger, a hose connects to my trusty fridge compressor, and at the inlet of the fridge compressor, I connect my big beach ball full of CO2. This is approximately 120 liters of gas, so there should be around 215 grams of CO2 in theory. In reality, it's probably a little less since there's bound to be some air mixed in there. The pressure reaches steady state at just under 200 PSI, which is consistent with a temperature of around minus 33C in the heat exchanger. The CO2 has much more thermal conductivity in the liquid phase, so it causes the outside of the lower connector to freeze. To collect the dry ice, I pipe the capillary tube into a thermos with a baffle of glass wool on the top to prevent high-speed gases from carrying away the tiny pieces of ice. The valve fitting leaks a little bit, but everything still seems to be working okay otherwise. And there you have it, a nice big pile of dry ice. Actually, it's really more of a snow because it's so fine and fluffy, so it doesn't sting to touch the way solid chunks of dry ice do. The ice still makes a fog in water, but because it's such a fine powder, it seems to evaporate way faster. I didn't measure the mass of the ice, but just by looking at it, it seems like a pretty decent yield considering I just had over 200 grams of CO2 gas in a best case. Using a vapor compression system to chill the high pressure gas definitely makes this process way more efficient than using an ice bath. My limestone decomposition process was pretty inefficient, but I think that can be changed if I can find some way to raise the temperature by 1 or 200 degrees C, which would exponentially increase the reaction rate. 
If I want to reach those temperatures using electricity, I'll probably need to use an HXO torch, an arc furnace, or maybe even resistive heating since the induction heater doesn't seem to want to go much over 900 C. If I can get this decomposition to happen at even 10% efficiency, CO2 can be collected from limestone for just a few cents per pound, which is orders of magnitude cheaper than any commercial supplier. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.